this guy's really interesting. Um, as you can, well, let me back up. As you can see here, what we're doing is going to basically psychology, which is not my field, but um, I can put together enough to help us talk about it. And I didn't know about a lot about this guy. Uh, really interesting guy, 1927, 1987, uh, University of Chicago and Harvard, but he was a member of the Haganah, uh, and that was a Jewish paramilitary organization uh, in the British Mandate of Palestine. Palestine, 1921 to 1948. Uh, this becomes the core of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, maybe that's not a good thing to be associated with these days or this week. He was captured by the British and held at an internment camp on Cyprus. So this, well, I mean, look at him. He's a nice psychology professor. Except he escaped from the internment camp. Basically a spy. Uh, and was in Palestine during the fighting in 1948 to establish a Jewish state. Uh, remember, that's when the Jewish state was established. And before that, British held Palestine. He refused to participate in the nonviolent forms of activism. Lived in a kibbutz um, and returned to America in 1948. That's when he enrolled at the University of Chicago in 1948. You could gain your degree uh, by taking an examination or a series of examinations. Uh, he took them and graduated with a bachelor's degree in one year wow. simply by demonstrating what he knew. Really interesting guy. Um, he based his work on Jean Piaget, and if you've ever been in education in any way, you know this name. Most educational theory and practices based on P.O.J. And why not? He's a sweet looking guy. Uh, nice little beret there. Director of the International Bureau of Education, he declared in 1934 that only education is capable of saving our societies from possible collapse, whether violent or gradual. He was employed at the Binet Institute in the 1920s. And his job, this is interesting too, was to develop French versions of the questions on English intelligence tests. Okay, so he's got to develop the French version of the English intelligence test. And that got him interested in how children learn. Uh, he was especially interested in why they gave the wrong answers. Which, uh, wrong answers tell you a lot more sometimes than right answers. And he thought he could base a theory on why they got those answers wrong. And so he's really the first psychologist. Now, of course, philosophers have been doing cognitive development for millennia since uh, the pre-Socratics um, and even in some other cultures. Um, but he was the first psychologist to focus on cognitive development, how we know how we come to know what we know. Um, and we'll, I'll talk about in the next slide his stage, his stage theory of cognitive development. Um, and so I find this really interesting and even ingenious is that we, even today, are so obsessed with, with standardized testing and what students know. He was interested in what students think, so, and, and even children, especially children. He, was, he wanted to know not that they could do arithmetic, but how they processed numerical thinking, mathematical thinking. He was interested in the process, not the product. Okay. Um, and for him, most people just assumed that children were undeveloped adults. Uh, but he showed, and I'll show you here, that there's actually a pretty clear developmental process cognitive thinking from the beginning of our lives. So, he called it genetic epistemology. Uh, epistemology is just a fancy word that means how we know. How do we know? It's a whole branch of philosophy about the nature of knowledge and how we acquire it, or if we acquire it. So there's the stages, little steps going up, and the 
first is the sensor row motor stage. You can see zero to two years. This is basically about object permanence. You know what that is, right? When you can no longer fake out a kid by making the ball disappear. It's like, no, I know the ball still can't say that. It knows it's there. Um, and so the, the child can form what he called a schema, uh, a mental representation of the, of the object that's not there. Pre-operational, two to six years. During this stage, children can think about being symbolic. They can make a word or an object stand in for something else, right? Uh, other than itself. This is huge. This is a huge development. Thinking is the basis of language, of course. Uh, at this stage, however, it's still egocentric. The child cannot imagine, imaginatively put her or himself into another person see the world from another person's view. Concrete oper operational 7 to 12 years, Piaget considered the concrete stage a major turning point in the development because here begins logical thought. The child can work out things internally in his or her head. Rather than moving things around, the child can sit and think through those issues. Have you ever seen this in a, in a child? It's, it's kind of amazing to watch. They're, they're like thinking. Uh, instead of moving the things on the ground, they're moving them in their head. This is things like number, mass, and weight become abstract for the child, as well as concrete. And then finally, formal operational, which is, uh, as you can see, 12 years to adult. Uh, people develop the ability to think about abstract concepts to logically test hypotheses, you and I, on a good day. All right, why are we talking about Piaget? Because you can't have Kohlberg without Piaget. What Kohlberg does is he looked at Piaget's work and said, I'm not sure it's about cognition because knowing things is one thing and behavior is another and the knowing and the behavior aren't necessarily connected. What I find connected is morality and behavior. In fact, that's how we judge morality is through behavior. So he replaces uh, Piaget's notion of cognition or maybe supplements is a better word with morality or ethics and then he expands the stages as I'll show you. So moral reasoning, reasoning which is a kind of reasoning, it's a kind of philosophical thinking, but it's certainly not epistemology, it's not cognition. The integration of ethics into the paradigm, and this was his 1958 dissertation. Of course, this too adds to the Piaget synthesis, of, with, along with Dewey and, and some other philosophers like me, to produce educational theory as it exists today, all right, Charlie, I've been behind on my puns, so let me see if I can catch it up. <laughs> been holding that one all day. <laughs> the Heinz dilemma. This is Mr. Heinz, but of course someone thought of a different kind of dilemma and went out to catch it. A woman was on her deathbed. There was one drug the doctors thought might save her. It was a form of radium that a druggist in the same town had recently discovered. The drug was expensive to make, but the druggist was charging ten times what the drug cost him to produce. This isn't exactly theoretical, is it? <laughs> um, he paid $200 for the radium, the druggist, and charged $2,000 for a small dose. The sick woman's husband, Mr. Hines, went to everyone he knew to borrow the money, but he could only get together about $1,000, which is half the cost of the dosage. He told the druggist that his wife was dying and asked him to sell it cheaper or to let him pay later. But the druggist says, nope, I discovered the drug and I'm going to make money from it. So Heinz got desperate and broke into the man's laboratory to steal the drug for his wife. Should Heinz have broken into the laboratory? 
is to the good drug by our body. This is the Heinz dilemma. This is what uh, Holberg used to test his subjects. So you're going to see here in the stages, well, I mean, there they are. I'm going to go into them, into them in more depth in a minute. Stage one of our moral development, according to Kohlberg, is simple obedience. Now, the important thing to realize with Kohlberg's theory is that it is not about particular outcomes. It is not about particular ethical choices. It is about the kind of ethical reasoning that occurs here. Okay? So you can get different outcomes, different behavioral outcomes. What he's concerned with is the moral reasoning. So, for example, um, it's stage one. Heinz should not steal the medicine because he'll consequently be put into prison, which means he's a bad person. Or Heinz should steal the medicine because it's only worth $200 and not how much the drug is wanted for it. Heinz had even offered to pay for it. He's not stealing anything else. So, again, that's two examples of that kind of reasoning in stage one. Wildly different outcomes, but the same kind of reason. Stage two, self-interest. Uh, Heinz should steal the medicine because he'll be much happier if he saves his life, even if he's in prison. <laughs> right? Or Heinz should not steal the medicine because prison is terrible, and he would more likely, more like, more likely languish in a jail cell, cell than over his wife's death. Different outcomes, same type of reasoning, self-interest. Conformity. I should steal the medicine because his wife expects it. And he wants to be a good husband. I see Sharon looking at David, right? Hein um, should not steal the or I should not steal the drug because stealing is bad and he's not a criminal. He's tried to do everything he can without breaking the law. He cannot blame him. Conformity. Stage four, law and order. Heinz should not steal the medicine. Why? Because the law prohibits it. It's illegal. Or, Heinz should steal the drug for his wife, but also take the punishment for the crime, as well as paying the druggist. Uh, criminals cannot just run around without regard to the law. Actions have social, judicial consequences. Same type of reason. Different behavior. Human rights. If you're seeing that these are hierarchical, you're right. Heinz should steal the medicine because everyone has a right to choose life regardless of the law. That right is above the law. Or Heinz should not steal the medicine because the scientist who developed the drug has a right to fair compensation. Even if his wife is sick, he does not make his action. actions right. Stage six, universal human ethics. Uh, if that sounds like Immanuel Kant, good for you. Heinz should steal the medicine because saving a human life is a more fundamental value than the property rights of another person. We're in a different level now. Or Heinz should not steal the medicine because others may need the medicine just as badly and their lives are equally significant. Okay, that's a quick overview. Here's a less quick overview. So, for Kohlberg, the six stages are divided into three levels. Two stages per level. All right. Basically, we're talking about pre-conventional morality. And I think, I mean, these are strange schema and jargon, but I think we know what it's talking about. We're talking about children who don't really follow ethical laws or codes, pre-conventional. Conventional, okay, this is what you should do, this is what you were taught to do or not to do, and you should just do that or not do that, because that's what you've been told, conventional morality, or post-conventional morality, where you see beyond the limitations of the moral system, the ethical system. Is any of this sounding familiar? It should. We're talking with Soren Kierkegaard in the background. Remember the aesthetic stage, the, the, the ethical stage, and the religious stage, uh, except 
Colbert's not going to go to the religious state. Or maybe he is. Let's see. All right, so the three levels, I think, are pretty simple. And he puts this t the two stages within those levels. Uh, stage one, again, obedience and punishment behavior driven by avoiding punishment. Uh, if, if this were Freud, we'd be, we might be talking about the id or the development of the ego. Individual Stage two, individual interest behavior. Self-interest and rewards, all right, that's less fear and more reward, but still uh, a very low-level, uh, individual, moral reasoning. If it's reasoning at all, it's simply, I want to feel this, I don't want to feel that. Conventional morality, interpersonal behavior driven by social approval, most of us live there. Authority, stage four, behavior driven by obeying authority and conforming to social order. All right, so, yeah, we'll, we'll get into all this. There's a lot to say here. And then finally, post-conventional morality, social contract behavior driven by balance of social order and individual rights. We got into this some when we talked about Hobbes um, a few series ago. And then stage six, universal ethics, behavior driven by internal moral principles. So um, stage one for Colbert is from about age two or three to five or six. Okay, seems about right. Uh, stage two, age five to seven, maybe up to age nine. Stage three, <laughs> sometimes called the good boy, nice girl age 7 to 12. Stage 4, law and order. Okay. Age 10 to 15. Stage 5, starting as early as age 12 and beyond. Stage 6, actually Colbert says most people don't get to stage 6. Reflection. One more in a, one more other way, just to make sure we're on the same page. At stage one, children think of what is right as that which authority says is right. And that's usually going to be parents. Doing the right thing is obeying authority and avoiding punishment. At stage two, children are no longer impressed by any, I like this, they're no longer impressed by any single authority. They see that there are different sides to any issue. It's everything is relative, one is free to pursue one's own interests, although it's important to make deals and exchanges with one another, because that's in your best interest. At stages three and four, young people think of themselves as members of society with its values, norms, and expectations. Does it sound like high school to me? So many pressures to conform. Uh, at stage uh, four, concern shifts from that of more immediate peer pressure, maybe, to obeying laws to maintain society as a whole. Uh, at stage five, we emphasize basic rights, democratic processes. At stage six, the, we define principles by which agreement will be most just. And stage six is very important because that's a trans-ethical state. It means you can change the ethics from there. You can't change it from the other stages. At, in his later work, Holberg actually talked about a stage seven, which he called, and we like this, the mystic stage. Now we're talking here. He sees this as meta-ethical. In this stage, individuals can problematize any action or intention by asking Themselves, whether it's moral. So it's meta ethical. All right, what about this theory? Some more about it. First of all, qualitative differences. The stages are qualitatively different, uh, meaning that there's not much overlap. I know, we don't like that. That's We don't like schema like that. We don't like to be our Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but 
I like to be tracked in a scheme. I want, to sit, I want the lines blurred. I want the boxes open. Right? But this is not Colbert. These are qualitative differences. So he's, he's marked these stages pretty rigid. You can't be in stage one and stage four at the same time. You just can't. He also talked about structured holes, meaning that these are not just isolated responses that children and young people have their general patterns of thought. Again, this is, I hope you saw that in the discussion of the stages. This is a type of, types of reasoning. The stages constitute types of reasoning, not particular behaviors. And so, they're really working from holistic systems that form ethical um, philosophies, really. All right, invariant sequence. Kohlberg says you must go through these stages, not that you must, but that we do go through these stages in order without variation. Uh, he will back this up with uh, a lot of data, a lot of longitudinal studies over time. Uh, children always go from stage one to stage two and stage three and so forth. He did discover what he termed regression, that people regressed back a stage but you, can, you must go through the stages in order. I think there's something American about this system. I just, I just don't like that. I don't want to be told that I have to go through something. Hierarchic integration, this is really important. Uh, and perhaps the most valuable part of this theory is that you do not leave behind the previous state. You integrate the previous state into the next state. So it, it's like um, it's like a ladder you're climbing up. You can't get to the top rung without using the bottom rung. You can't move forward in life without going through these stages and using what you learn from it. That resonates, I think, with, with those of us who come here and talk about these things, is that nothing is wasted, is the implication. Right? And that's a good Traumatic, I think, if you thought a stage of your life was wasted. For Kohlberg, it's not. It gets integrated and elevated as you go. And then universal sequence. He says this is the same in all cultures. And again, he has data to back this up. Uh, obviously, it's qualitative data, uh, interviews and such. But for Kohlberg, it's going to happen to everybody, everywhere, every these stages. Okay. Criticisms of Kohlberg. Well, um, there are plenty, as you might guess. First of all, lots of critics don't like the notion of a post-conventional morality, uh, especially cognitive theory. Because you can't measure it. Right? it, it be, and it moves toward the mystical. Right? So um, if you've got a post convention, you've got a post conventional anything. What are you supposed to do with this? And again, I would call us back to Kierkegaard. You, when you get into the religious stage, all bets are off. You're on your own. There's no pack. It's like Jay Krishnamurti wrote that the flight of the eagle is pathless. So if you want to follow the sacred, if you want to become a full, fuller, the fullest human being you can be, Jung would say this too, is that there's no path except your path, which is visible only to you. All right. uh, but that's not a good thing to talk about for social scientists, especially cognitive. Cultural bias. All right, um, I think this is probably a fair criticism. Uh, some of you know that my studies are in Native American literature and religion, Native American cultures, and I've read a number of stories about, well, uh, well they don't call it this typically, but it's basically about this issue of morality in Native American cultures. And, and I recall a story about a young man who committed suicide, and 
it was in one of the pueblos. And the tribe came together and wept and mourned for what they did to the other, or what they didn't do for them. So one of the assumptions of Kohlberg's theory is a kind of Cartesian enlightenment self, unconnected to other self. And that's simply not the way of the world. It isn't maybe the way of our world uh, here in the West and here in America. It's simply not the way of the world for, uh, for many people who've lived on, in the world and on the planet. In fact, I would suggest that this is a relatively new phenomenon that was born of individualism that flounder, that uh, flourishes during the Enlightenment. There is a book. Uh, out a few years ago, arguing that the notion of the individual was invented in the 17th century. I like that. You can see how that's true. Not that there were no individuals before that, of course there were, but that the individual did not see herself as an individual. She saw herself as part of a clan, a family, a tribe, a nation. That's where the identity came from. It's only in the late Western, uh, in late Western intellectual history, that the individual becomes a thing. And I know that it's ingrained itself in us, and, and there are many advantages to that. There are also some disadvantages. And we can talk about that in the discussion. I hope. Gender bias. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. For a couple of reasons, I think you've probably seen it already as I've gone through the theory. And our penultimate, our next to last talk will be about the woman who critiques Kohlberg and offers a different understanding of moral development based on gender. That is Carol Gilly. She, she was his student. She worked with him. and saw what he was doing, participated in the research, furthered the research, but said, I'm not sure this holds for little girls. And the same way it holds for little girls. And so we'll talk, as I said, about in a different voice, Carol Gilly. And accordingly, she, she looks at, I'm glad to tell you, she looks at it not in terms of moral reasoning, in terms of something like justice at, at the highest stage, or self-interest at the lowest, lower stages. She says little girls and big girls and women look at it at this in terms of care, of survival and care. And that's a little prelude to the lecture and the discussion. There's also a sense of ethical optimism in Kohlberg that's perhaps naive. I don't know. So you may have come upon this already as you've thought about it through my talk so far. Is, isn't this a rather flat, uh, naive may be too strong, or at least um, not dynamic sense of ethics. For example, um, how do we resolve, if we're at all at stage six, how do we resolve the issue of, say, abortion? What, what process of, of ethical reasoning, what will that produce in terms of abortion, the issue of abortion, or war, or terrorism? Obviously, it, it hasn't produced a lot, because if you take an ethics course anywhere, anytime, it's probably going to be organized around the dilemmas that we can't solve, like those that I mentioned. So, if this is how we develop, if we develop morally, and that's who we are as people, then we kind of suck. Because we can't figure stuff out. So what's the value of an ethical theory, or, or a theory based on ethical reasoning where we don't go with that? Sure, maybe our thinking matures in these ways. <coughs> You know, I kept saying, don't look at the outcome, but at some point you have to look at the outcome. What, what does this kind of thinking produce at each stage, especially at higher stages? 
as it helps. Still, I think Holberg adds a lot to our understanding of how we become who we are in stages along this way. Uh, first of all, he shifts the focus from Piaget's epistemology uh, to moral reasoning. I think that's a good shift because epistemology is one thing, moral reasoning is quite another. It's much more immediate, right? Moral reasoning is something you do every day when you want to or not. Do you let the person in who's merging in the city? The answer is yes, you always do that. You don't do that when you know the person. <laughs> I'm just going to state that from my moral reasoning. Um, I always tell students when, I'm taking, when they're taking philosophy courses with me, a lot of this is going to be abstract, but I never say that with ethics, because ethics is never abstract. It's something, and actually we're going to talk about this in a minute, it's something we do, though it's not always something we think about. We'll see. So I think it's good that the shift occurred from Piaget, if only to supplement. You know about the trolley problem? Yeah. <laughs> Anna, or Flanders, standing on the embankment above a train track, watching a train track maintenance team do its work, suddenly Flanders hears the tr sound of the train barreling down the track. Brakes have failed, and the train's heading for the six workers. The side Flanders is a lever. If he pulls it, the train is forced onto a sidetrack and will grind to a halt without harming anyone. Good. No ethical problem, right? Just do that. Suppose Flanders now finds himself in the same situation, and in fact this situation, where there's still family guy on the track, but now Homer Simpson is eating a donut on the other track. So the only two choices are to kill Homer Simpson or to kill the family guy. Now it gets more complicated. And you can add to this. Uh, there's been some really interesting writing on the trolley problem of late, especially about how it's too abstract. But anyway, you can do that on your own. Really, uh, Philip of but 1967, this problem's been around with classical ethical uh, reasoning or, or scenario that asks students and you to think about what you would do. And again, it's a Kohlberg approach, not what you would do, but why you would do what you would do. What's the reasoning process? Uh, well, a couple of um, scholars put this scenario on their website at Harvard, uh, Hauser in particular, and ask people to solve the problem. Uh, it's an amazing consensus that was reached, and non-consensus at the same time. 89% 80 of the subjects agree that Homer Simpson must die. <laughs> Easy, right? Because it's, it's counting. 89%. Now, there's another twist to the trolley, the trolley problem. <laughs> Let's add Elmer Fudd to it. Uh, and that is, what if, in order to save Family Guy, the, the family, you have to push someone onto the track? How does that change? Remember, 89% say, yeah, I'm cool with that. Homer can go down. He's having a donut. He'll be happy as he goes. <laughs> but I'm not going to push Stewie onto the track. I'm just not going to do it. I don't care how many lives it saves. It can save 100 lives. I'm not going to push someone onto the track to save those lives. Why not? Well, uh, the study shows that this is true, this is true, 89% will easily sacrifice Homer, no one will sacrifice the person by taking action against the person. Uh, no one will do that. 
women's choices, indistinguishable for, for men's in this survey. Jews, Muslims, Catholics, teenagers, parents, grandparents, all the same. I'm happy to sacrifice one person through a mechanical device, and I'm not happy to do it through my own hand. The moral instinct, Hauser and his colleagues conclude, is universal. The expression of that universal instinct, instinct they say, is anything but. Because their justifications, once you ask them why, they know with an uncommon certainty what they would do. They cannot tell you. They cannot articulate. They cannot give you even a two-sentence argument for why Homer should die, but not a person in the world. Less than one in three could come up with the moral difference between the active choice of pushing someone into the tracks simple throwing of a lever to sacrifice one person to save them. Less than one third. What does that say? Well, for me, I think and some others, I think it means that morality is a lot like language. And here I'm going to borrow from Rebecca Sachs, S-A-X-E, in a piece called Cognitive Science's Search for a Common Morality, because I think she puts it better. But basically, think about morality as a kind of language. And listen to what she says here. Um, we can draw three predictions from the theory that morality operates as a language. Game. First, just as each speaker can produce and understand an infinite number of completely original sentences, every moral reasoner can make fluent, confident, and compelling moral judgments about an infinite number of ethical cases, unique cases, including ones they've never imagined. Second, cross-culturally, systems of moral reasoning can be as diverse as human languages are, without uh, precluding the universal system of rules derived from our biological inheritance that underlines, underlies and governs all these surface-level differences. If, those, if there are any linguists in the audience you're hearing, Noam Chomsky in the background and his theory of a uh, structural sorry, uh, uh, universal grammar, basically. Finally, just as native speakers are unable to articulate rules of grammar that they obey when speaking, the practitioners of moral judgment may have great difficulty articulating the principles that inform their Right? Can you articulate the reason why your sentences are formed the way they are? I'll never forget teaching uh, a literature professor, basically, uh, with some other cool stuff thrown in. I remember teaching my very first English, English class. It was uh, at a community college, and it was a classic English class where you write a five-paragraph essay, and you read great writers. So I remember taking the first couple weeks and talking about grammar, syntax, and mechanics, and punctuation, and structure of the sentence, and all that. And then we got to the literature part, and we read uh, the brilliant Alice Walker's short story, Everyday Use. And my student says, she isn't doing any of this. Well, what? You're right, she's not. <laughs> and hers is more fun. <laughs> Weird. Right? So I was trying to articulate this grammar behind what they're doing, and that, that's still very helpful and useful. But the fun part comes when you read it. And you use it. And you lay it And you think about what that thought is that you have. And so I repeat it. So you have to know the rules and break the rules and then you do it. And you really should be completely Think about, if we think about morality as a language, we might get out of some of the theoretical problems that we're going to have to solve. And being raised in postmodernism and post-structuralism, as I was in my doctoral study, I liked it, because I think language is a very important thing. Well, 
Some, some studies of morality in the brain. I'm never a big fan of these because I'm not a thinker, so I'm immediately skeptical. But let's talk about it. Uh, Jorge Moll, who you probably don't really know, he wrote the Pink Book, uh, did MRIs on pain receptors and measured the blood oxygen levels in the brain while they read different sentences describing moral and social violations. So some of the sentences were, they hung an MRI camera on you. He licked your dirty clothes. And usually the sentences were not that sensitive. The stones were made of water. They found that one brain region in the medial orbitofrontal cortex behind the space between the eyebrows had a higher oxygenation level while the subject read the moral sentences than either of the two other brain regions. So this part of the brain, the medial orbitofrontal cortex. So he proposes that the medial orbitofrontal cortex must play some unique role in our moral reasoning. In his gauge, look this guy up if you're interested in reading about him. So he survived. He not only survived, he had a speech, emotion, intelligence, and all that. And he lived right through the war. So good for him. He he went to the war. (laughs) He survived. Seven years as an exhibit at the Tavern of Peace. Then he went to the Soviet Union. You kind of remind me of Soviet Russia when you talk about this. Modern patients with similar brain damage show the same kind of deficit in their brain. Seen, irreverent, uninhibited, and they show disastrous judgment by the first time. So, as you might imagine, this is depressing. Uh, This is usually what happens when a client tries to reduce something to a minimum. By the way, the mythology goes the same way. He tries to, not for one thing, but he tries to reduce the will to something manageable. Um, So, of course, and this is the beauty and the frustration of the design of the brain. That's yet another What's the relationship between morality and culture? This is what we're about here. We're the University of Philosophical Research, so we often have to explain that. Uh, I have a lot of intellectual property research here, but I, I never 
never seen the phrase anywhere but here. Uh, but I know what Manly Mall meant when he created the post office over here. But I do know philosophy. The gentleman loved philosophy. It's the love of the philos and the philosophy. It's the love of the world. What's the relationship? Sorry. Uh, it's about beauty. Yeah. <laughs> it's about following following a law simply because it's the right thing to do, regardless of the consequences. Okay? And that's beauty. I like that. Lots of fun stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's uh, that's one of the most fun things in the book. Is that, yeah. That that weird thing for the sake of politics that might be the right thing, but it's actually the right thing. Yeah, or Words just simply it highlights the essential need to end the war. But what's the ultimate goal of this issue? Are we going to save Bart's uh, Homer Simpson? I mean, people like Bart, he's a Bart is just hilarious. Um, are you going to save Homer Simpson or Manly Mall? Well, that's the means to answer it. I think with the greatest wish, the greatest number, we're going to save Homer Simpson. But there's also a virtuous act is one done by a virtuous person. You see, so there's this kind of uh, Kantian kind of thought. Duty is a duty. Again, that's a system outside of what we call God or uh, categorical imperative or concordant. It's outside of you. Or you're following consequentialism or teleology Bentham actually created this notion, I forget what he calls it, but it's basically units of ethics. So if you did X and Y and Z in this particular situation, you got 17 ethics. Okay, so uh, are we going to do so much? I mean, again, don't get me started. Uh, but frankly, to be honest, the, most of us are consequentialists. Outside of you, are you going to let your ethical reason trump that reality? Are you? Much like the goal of the universal good here in Kierkegaard, I've already mentioned it. The aesthetic, where you function according to pleasure, you seek pleasure at that level, then you move to the ethical level, not then, because this is a good, you know, all is good, all free. But there's the ethical. Example um, that you might hear in our discussion right now is Abraham's sacrifice of his son. He followed God, which is going to the uh, other country, other son that holds the promise of the great promise. That's how radical following God is in the world. We talked, we mentioned the Sermon on the Mount briefly. Uh, 
the Sermon on the Mount. Remember Jesus speaking in the Sermon, uh, the sermon on the Mount. This is, you know, this is the great moral staging that he does where he says, you know, uh, you've heard it said that you shouldn't commit murder. But I say that if you hate your brother, you can commit murder on your own. There. You have said, you sh- you've heard it Sermon on the Mount, where he says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Yeah. So, what can you expect when I talk about that this week? <laughs> Not actually in that sermon. Um, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What does this mean? Wisdom is beyond me. Perfection is beyond me. That's the message of the Sermon on the Mount. I, I get it. Because I can't be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. So maybe I can do all this. Okay, so there's always, so, so wisdom, I think, is always this upper thing, right? That doesn't exist as a component of the system, it exists. Without and within the system. That's what wisdom is. Okay, and James, right? He who says does not know. And he knows that he does not know. It can be made to know by the Holy Spirit. All right, where do we go from there? Just shut up. <laughs> Except the way of the vicar that say, No problem. Here's a book called The Ethics of Ambiguity. He said, How can you not create an ethical system when you're trying to put the soldier along with the public man? It just makes no sense. You need to put the ethics in there. And it's an ethics of ambiguity because it's you, an absurd creature, living in an absurd world. the great Buddhist tradition is wisdom of the Buddha. It's not just Buddha. So while wisdom, I think, can lend ethics, it also lends 